We will then proceed. Um, just to let you know, I'm not going to be giving long introductions because uh, there's very ample information in this pamphlet which you, which you should have in your packet. So it's my pleasure to welcome Paul Crowley, the Jesuit community professor in the Department of Religious Studies here at Santa Clara University, to speak on suffering and the, the mystery of evil, believing in an unmoored God. Paul. Um, I'd like to uh, dedicate uh, this presentation to uh, Father Bill Steger, uh, one of our Jesuit confreres, who would be here today if he could be. He's uh, very ill up in Los Gatos. Uh, he's a great contributor to the whole discussion of religion and science, theology and science, um, and has worked for many years at the Vatican Observatory. So he needs our prayers, and um, I dedicate this to him. Although, what I'm about to say is not worthy of what he could say. <laughs> Suffering, as we know, is a problem, uh, we all, one which we all encounter, a privation of the good, of what has been created good, and thus it is an expression of the mystery of evil within the created order. And it raises questions for us about what kind of God we are talking about and what kind of God we might be able to possibly believe in. I'm going to be approaching this question uh, through three movements here today. First of all, discussing a bit this notion, a notion called homelessness, homelessness in the universe, which is given us by Martin Buber, the great Jewish thinker. Secondly, how theology, Christian theology, has tried to look at this problem of suffering and the mystery of evil through uh, theories of providence, We'll also look just briefly at theodicy. And finally, what it might mean to believe in God, in a God who seems to be so unmoored from the world in which we are living. And in this section, I will look briefly at uh, the thinking of Karl Rahner. The Jewish philosopher Martin Buber writes of two epochs in the history of the human spirit, an epoch of habitation and an epoch of homelessness. The epoch of habitation, which aligns with an Aristotelian view of the universe, gives us a picture of unsurpassable clarity as a universe of things, where man is one of these things and is an objectively comprehensible species beside other species. In this view, the human species has a sense of home, a sense of place in the universe as a whole. As in the cosmos of Aristotle, uh, this creaturely habitation occupies a central place in the cosmic hierarchy, right in the middle there. Man is the measure of all things and stands at the center of a cosmos rationally ordered around this supremely rational animal. This model stands in contrast, Buber says, to the epoch of homelessness limbed by Aristotle's teacher Plato and further developed by Augustine. Here, the human being does not belong to the world of things, but is caught between this earthly imprisonment and higher aspirations of his pure nature. Homeless in the world, solitary between the higher and the lower powers, he remains homeless and solitary even after he finds salvation in Christianity as a redemption that has already taken place. If the pre-Copernican universe is a picture of the epoch of habitation, the final demolition of that picture by Galileo and later by post-Newtonian physics would create the cosmic image of homelessness. So homelessness is at once a physical or cosmic and existential reality for humankind, we who are lost in the cosmos. One constant across both epochs is the reality of physical suffering, pain, decline, and death. Let us consider this form of human suffering in relation to God, understood here for the moment as the omnipotent supremely be, supreme being commonly assumed in classical theology. In the epoch of habitation, physical suffering can be seen as belonging to the order of things established by God, who created all things in freedom, including human beings. According to this narrative, physical suffering and the consequences of it leading up to and including death are understood to result from God's judgment upon the sin of Adam. 
The suffering endured as a result of natural catastrophe, such as the flood, is also read in this light. It is this condition of suffering that God in his mercy meets with a number of redemptive missions, the last of which, according to the Christian story, is the sending of his son. Why does God become man, asks Anselm, the answer, in order to save us from ourselves and thus to reestablish the order that was lost, to restore us to our habitation, to a sense of being at home in the place God originally placed us by restoring us to a state of undefiled nature. From the Garden of Eden, we pass through the Garden of Gethsemane and end up in the Garden of the Empty Tomb, where the road begins to a new heaven and a new earth. This storyline still governs the Christian imagination. But there is a new wrinkle to the story. For the center of this drama, Jesus is himself not at home in the world. He is caught between earth and heaven in a painful tension. During his earthly life, he literally has no place to lay his head. He is homeless in a very real way, and he suffers greatly, not only in spirit, but in body. We are told that while enduring the agony of the cross, he experienced the dereliction of abandonment by God, a sense that God was not there, and that he cried into what Rahner described as the trackless dark and the wilderness of God. There is no orientation point in the darkness, no roadmap out of the wilderness, no ultimate rationality to draw order out of the chaos of physical suffering. For those of us who float in this realm of homelessness, not only are there few, if any, trustworthy bearings, but the heavens seem a limitless, lifeless void that do not so much as echo back our cries. As Buber writes, Pascal, the great scientist, a mathematician and a physicist, young and destined to die early, experienced beneath the starry heavens, not merely as Kant did their majesty, but still more powerfully, their uncanniness. The silence, the eternal silence of that grass, that vast space, infinite space, instills in me great fear. And he says that this is the sobriety of the man who has become more deeply solitary than ever before, and with a sober pathos, he frames the anthropological question afresh. What is a human being in the midst of the infinite? In this epoch of homelessness, the human being is alone in her suffering because God no longer seems to be connected with us. God, too, seems to have floated away, unmoored from the earth he has set in motion, distant from his suffering people, indeed from all his groaning creation. Yet somehow, we insist, God bears responsibility for this whole process, which, if Newton was right, he set in motion in the first place. How then are we to locate God again? For moderns, the framing of the problem takes us back to the 1755 Lisbon earthquake, a catastrophe of such monumental proportions that it gave rise to a new and trenchant questioning about God in relation to suffering. Theodicy, a neologism coined by Gottfried Leibniz 45 years earlier, was now aloft. And its fundamental question rings in our ears today. How can we square the suffering that befalls us with an all-good and all-powerful God? The seeming comfort of Leibniz's formulation that we live in the best of all possible worlds was betrayed by the event of 1755. And this was occurring at a time when it was by now settled that human beings could no longer imagine that they were situated at the center of the cosmos. The Galileo affair had occurred 100 years earlier. And so the question gets not only to God's self-defense, but to God's very self. What kind of God are we imagining here, and in what kind of God are we expecting ourselves to believe? In his book, Evil and the God of Love, John Hick anachronistically applies the term theodicy to thinkers such as Irenaeus and Augustine, for whom the justification of God was an unimaginable proposition. For Augustine in particular, the question was how one could place human suffering within the schema of an all-provident all God. 
This differs from theodicy because it introduces into discussion something that had been largely forgotten in theodicy, moral evil, and the tangled relationality between human freedom, sin, and the suffering that eventuates in death. God has to justify himself only if human beings have nothing to do with what has happened, even in a natural catastrophe. But in Augustine's world, things are different. Influenced by Paul, to be sure, but also by his early Manichaeism, it was not difficult for Augustine to see creation as having been infected by human sinfulness. He even sees signs of it in the squalling of babies for mother's milk. If the modern, if modern, the, the modern theodicy question had anything to do with uh, ancient thinking, the proper predecessor was more likely Boethius, who in the Consolation of Philosophy, by tradition written while he was imprisoned, and awaiting his execution, wrestles with the question of how free will can be reconciled with a universe that has been preordained by God. One of the things he comes up here with is the Wheel of Fortune. Next time you watch that on TV, you'll know where it came from. <laughs> Augustine deals with this question in several works, uh, which I won't go into here, and it was taken up again by uh, Aquinas in the Summa Theologiae. Um, in his doctrine on predestination, my pages are, some of them are upside down, um, that safeguarded human freedom and autonomy. On the level of lived religion, this view encouraged a religiosity of aligning one's will with what one hoped was the will of God, as we were to see in Calvinism and Jansenism. Jansenism. Although abstracted from our day-to-day -day affairs, God was highly important and ultimately connected with reality on the ground for the world had been constructed out of his provident will, a view represented in the image of God the geometer from the 13th century, protractor in hand, carefully measuring out the dimensions of the universe. But this ancient discourse of providence was displaced by theodicy, and the shortcomings of the theodicy project have been noted by several scholars. John Thiel and Terence Tilly, for example, argue that it only served to further distance God from the action, opening the door to rationalism, you know, if not agnosticism, and that these purely philosophical projects do not take into account sufficiently the data of revelation on which faith in God depends. All of that is certainly valid from a theologian's point of view, but I would add that the deeper problem with theodicy is that it presumes a God who has been cast in question. For not only has physics unmoored the old god from the earth and her cosmos, so too the notion of cosmic evolution, or in theological terms of ongoing creation, has made it ever more difficult to imagine how to locate God in relation to the universe. In an expanding picture of the universe, the ever more rapid movement outward strains our categories of the infinite, traditionally tied to a space-time continuum. We cannot speak with confidence of a contained universe or of a universe with boundaries, outside of which, according to the old model, God would somehow be standing, encompassing the whole. For this would be to reduce God in actuality to another layer of reality. What the evolu uh, evolutionary and expanding universe does with God is far more radical and restores God to his absolute otherness. Now, absolute otherness is not his absolute distance. Yes, God is unmoored, but that is simply to say that God falls outside the rules of the grammars of this world and that the laws of nature cannot explain God, much less understand God, a fallacy often made when people misunderstand what is meant by natural law, turning it into an ideology of nature, as we see, for example, in the theology of the body. But the very fact that God falls outside the laws of nature raises further problems with regard to suffering, a recasting of the old problems. For now we have to ask whether God is somehow responsible for blind and random forces of nature that in an evolutionary march result in so much suffering and death. We are, in a sense, back to the theodicy question. Why is it, how is it that this God, now untethered from the universe, nevertheless has set things up so that the only way forward is through suffering and death. Does this mean that somehow God has intended these things in the first place? And if so, what does that imply about God? I see two ways of approaching this. One is to grant nature its autonomy, 
an autonomy that does not include God. In that autonomy, part of the goodness of nature following its own autonomous course is the suffering that we experience as the pawns of nature tossed about like so much flotsam and jetsam. This is something which, to some degree, we must simply accept, just as we accept the tides, the winds, and the movement of the stars. Death, too, is a natural phenomenon, a datum of reality, and when we die, we are dead as doornails. Finis, end of story, goodbye. Or we could opt for the autonomous creation idea, but at the same time reconsider what we mean by divine action in relation to creation. This means that older models of providence, with their Christian providence in Paul and Boethius and Augustine, and leading up to the debates of theodicy, need to be interrogated again. I would propose here, as an alternate route, one that came out of the early modern humanism of the University of Paris, where one student in the early 16th century was Ignatius of Loyola. For Ignatius, the providence of God was not a map for navigating the shoals of life. He did not stand in that tradition of Boethius and Augustine. For Ignatius, the providence of God was not a map, for, uh, but rather the providence of God was seen as an activity, ongoing and unceasing, corresponding to God's own essay at being not standing alone out there, but being in unceasing activity within the present moment. This is a God of time, more than a God of spatiality, or better, a God of the er eternality of the moment, and of moments in succession and cascading one upon the other. We get a glimpse of this theology in the final phase of his spiritual exercises, uh, the contemplation to attain divine love. I will consider how God labors and works for me in all the creatures on the face of the earth, working in the heavens, elements, plants, fruits, cattle, and all the rest, giving them their existence, conserving them, concurring with their vegetative and sensitive activities, and so forth. I will consider how all good things and gifts descend from above, just as the rays come down from the sun or the rains from their source. This God is no longer featured as the uncaused cause, although he might still be that, but rather as love, whose being is creating act, and who by virtue of his being establishes creation, that which is not God, in its full autonomy. It seems to me that this model of providence is more apposite to our quantum and evolutionary charged imaginations than the more static notions of God's providence that were presumed in the past. God remains unmoored, decentered, but not for that reason disengaged. So where does this lead us? What does it mean then to believe in such an unmoored God? And here's where I turn to Karl Rahner. Rahner is compelling here because he struggles to maintain intellectual honesty in the face of all that we are dealing with. The sheer givenness of suffering and death the loss of a former sense of habitation due to our situatedness in a vast and expanding universe, the unfathomable elusiveness of any location of God, and the microcosmos most that is the human being, that juncture between matter and spirit. Rahner is pollucively clear that there is no escaping the harshness of suffering and the unanswerable finality of death. These are inalienable parts of creation which we in our creatureliness are fated to undergo, just as did Jesus, whose appearance occurs within the evolution of the cosmos, not as an extrinsic insertion into it. Because Jesus Christ was the one who emptied himself and underwent suffering and death, the Christian, Rahner says, is one category of human being who cannot look upon religion as an opiate or an analgesic. For the problem of suffering lies at the heart of the revelation of who God is for the creature. To carry this further, there is a convergence of the mystery of suffering with the mystery of God. That is, the incomprehensibility of suffering is, because of Jesus' foundational experience, part of the revelation of the incomprehensibility of God. Not of God himself, but of God's incomprehensibility. And here is what Rahner says to that. The incomprehensibility of suffering is part of the incomprehensibility of God. Not in the sense that we could deduce it as necessary 
and thus inevitably as clarified from something else that we already know of God, if this were so, it would not be at all incomprehensible. But the very fact that it is really and eternally incomprehensible means that suffering is truly a manifestation of God's incomprehensibility in his nature and in his freedom. Now there's much to be unpacked in that sentence, but one key insight is that we cannot, in theodicy-like fashion, calculate divine action or gauge divine freedom. So what then of evil? Evil is not necessarily the mystery we always crack it up to be. It is, Rahner says, parasitic of the good. It presupposes the good. This does not mean that evil is not real, but that its existence depends upon the prior good of things as they have been and are being created. And God, who is working on and sustaining all things by his lovingness, as Ignatius would have it, is drawing forth what is good even from death. This is simply the central insight of the resurrection from the dead that Christians confess in faith. Rahner by no means wishes to suggest that therefore all is settled and that God has finally been captured again and that we can return to our habitations of old. It is an ever new creation that is underway through the divine action. This means that the Christian will be both an utter realist about creaturely life as we in fact experience it and at the same time because of what has been disclosed by God of God's self already a being of self-transcending hope. This hope need not lead to an unrealistic optimism, an otherworldly or thisworldly utopianism, but rather to hoping, understood as a mode of being in act, a proleptic living into and for the future in God, something along the lines of what uh, John was saying earlier. Believing then is not in the first instance the giving of intellectual assent to formulations of faith and the like, but is an act of being on the part of the suffering creature, a kenosis unto God who cannot be located out there, yet who by virtue of his very nature is acting upon the suffering of the cosmos in love, eradicating parasitic evil and generating the good of a new creation. Finally, Rahner can say that yes, God is far from us, especially, I would say, if we ask where is God within the experience of creaturehood in an epoch of homelessness. And this sense of God's being unmoored and floating about just as we are floating about can lead to despair. But it is simply despair in the ability to believe any longer in a false notion of God, in an intellectual idol. That would be the God who was at issue in the heyday of theodicy but also the God who has been presupposed in so much of the debates going on between science and religion. This omnipotent, omniscient, supernatural being, a being among beings, is in the final analysis another problematic object. So go on, Rahner says, despair of that God, because all you're doing is venting your frustration at an idol, an intellectual idol that can also become a religious idol. In his apophatic way, Rahner wishes to remind us that such constructions of God are delimiting, misleading, and false. The God we are concerned with is indeed unmoored from the world of theological round and square pegs or holes, indeed from the world or laws of nature. At the same time, in an Augustinian twist that we find in Rahner, this God is nearer to us than we are to ourselves, in timior intimo meo. Yet this God is not us, is not steering our course, and is not the cause of our suffering and death. As a positively theological statement, we can say that this is a God revealed in an emphatic no to suffering and death in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and an emphatic yes uh, to the good of creation. It is not the mystery of evil that should preoccupy us, it is the mystery of God which is so much denser. This God is the mystery with which we must live in life, in faith, in prayer, as we suffer through this existence and eventually die. But as we gaze at the stars, which Ignatius did through tears, and as Pascal did in fear and trembling, 
We have ample warrant to give ourselves over to this unfathomable mystery in peace. Thank you.